Hannah to do the introduction of what climate action planning is here at UF and what that looks like while I edit the accessibility of that document. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, I'm going to try and go through this relatively quickly. Um, so I'm going to talk about the climate action plan and how academics fit it, fits into it. But honestly, normally this a presentation of this size takes me about 30 to 40 minutes, and I'm going to try and do it in like five to seven minutes. So um, I'm going to focus really heavily on academics, but if there are more questions about other parts of the plan, we always have time for that too. Um, so let me kick it off um, with a little short introduction of our office. What does our office do? So um, the UF Office of Sustainability is um, located within the administrative side of the university. We're under business affairs, under facility services. Um, and we often work as a connector across campus, um, bringing people together to work on sustainability initiatives, whether it's related to um, ecological uh, restoration, economic development, or social equity. We are not the only people working on sustainability on campus in the slightest, like there are so many groups working on this, but we often serve as connecting the um, dots or, you know, starting conversations um, with the right groups across campus that are working on sustainability efforts and initiatives um, on campus. So the climate action plan update. Right now, um, we are excited to be uh, towards the end of our process to update the UF climate action plan, our CAP 2.0. Um, this process was launched in 2021 and January of 2021, um, but it did. We did have a lot of momentum going into that launch as well. We did community listening sessions over the year 2020. Um, one of them was in person, one of them was virtual, and that really helped launch the momentum for our um, climate action planning process. So over the past year into 2022, we've been working with working groups to develop recommendations in a variety of areas that relate to climate action on campus. Um, and now as we're moving into 2022, we're working on that, uh, taking all those recommendations, continuing to refine them and finalize them and draft a plan for um, the uh, advisory groups and UF leadership to review. So that's where we're at in the process right now. It might shift a little bit and change depending on how much more revision and approval we need for the implementation plans. Um, but what does the uh, climate action plan cover? So a uh, climate action plan can have a different definition at every institution, anywhere you go. But at the University of Florida, we're looking for a campus-wide strategic framework for reducing and mitigating UF's greenhouse gas emissions, as well as supporting the university's academic mission and improving the university's resilience to climate change impacts. So there's a couple different branches of this. Um, but before I get into that, I'm going to talk about some of the context going into this plan. Why this plan? Why are we doing it now? Why did we start this in 2021? Uh, well, the last climate action plan was published in 2009, version 1.0. That cap, um, since then, we're able to design a cap 2.0 that builds off of the achievements um, that were realized from that plan, but also beyond that plan um, across operations, academics, transportation, and other groups. It's also um, really highly aligned with UF's vision. UF is very driven by having a, um, a vision for campus and following core values, and the Climate Action Plan fits really uh, well within the stewardship uh, mission piece of um, UF's mission, vision, and um, it also brings together several impact areas. It's a collaborative effort across lots of different groups on campus, which like I said, our office often serves as like that kind of connector across campus. So this is um, really well suited for the way that uh, the university operates and working across groups um, in these different sectors. And last but definitely not least um, is the immediacy of climate change action. You know, we are looking to move um, targets and move parameters forward quickly so that we can mitigate and adapt for a resilient um, and emis lower emissions campus. So a little bit about the planning process. I tried to summarize it up here. Um, our planning process was initially from the beginning led by core values, really focused heavily on developing common goals and values across different groups, building those relationships and creating a vision that's gonna inspire long into the future and be a sustainable climate action plan of that living framework that we're looking for. 
Um, like I mentioned, we started in 2021. And um, when we started, uh, we've involved lots of different working groups across campus. The stakeholders involved include about 100 different people um, in our working groups, advisory group, and planning team. And those groups are made up of staff, faculty, and students. M the majority of those are selected experts or implementers, whether they're expert faculty or the, you know, the people, the practitioners on campus in our staff groups that are actually going to be implementing some of the strategies that we're discussing in the Climate Action Plan. Um, we also had a uh, some city and county staff participate as well as seat. Um, we had applications open for people to participate in those working groups as well. So we included a very inclusive group of um, um, stakeholders in our working groups from the beginning. And throughout this process, we've done as much as we can to make the process as transparent and accessible as we can, um, having lots of different outlets and opportunities for students, staff, and faculty to engage and learn more about the process. And though it's been a little bit difficult doing that all virtually, we're very happy with a lot of the engagement that we've gotten over the past year and think it's going to set us up well for a successful climate action plan. So I'm just going to skip over that. So what our focus areas are in CAP. Um, so we have five main focus areas. I'm not going to go into all of them in detail, but um, we do have our um, uh, these five different areas. Uh, generally, I try and talk about some of the FAQs, the vision and the strategies, but I'm really only going to talk about academics in that level of detail. So um, but what are we talking about when we're talking about the emissions? This is just a snapshot of our greenhouse gas inventory. As you can see, there's lots of different areas that contribute to our um, greenhouse gas emissions here at the University of Florida, the largest being energy, and that goes into cooling and heating buildings, and the other groups being transportation, a small portion coming from waste, and a smaller portion coming from miscellaneous, which includes fertilizers and agriculture and refrigerants. So, like I said, just briefly going over some of these groups because we do get a lot of questions about these. What are we talking about when we're talking about energy and buildings? In the Climate Action Plan, we're talking about energy efficiency. We're talking about renewable energy, how to increase on campus and purchase solar, innovative thermal solutions for our buildings. How do we optimize our building systems? Increasing our sustainable building certifications. We have over 80 lead building projects here on campus and um, we're hoping to expand that even more in the future. Um, and then in offsets and finance, we're talking about high quality offsets, we're talking about um, innovative educational offsets, um, and we're also talking about funding. How do we fund all these different strategies? And ultimately, we're talking about a path towards carbon neutrality that focuses on those carbon reductions first and limits our reliance on carbon offsets so that we can achieve a long-term carbon neutrality and not just a one and done or like a one-off year where we are carbon neutral, but one that's gonna sustain us into the future. Um, and in transportation, another big area for our emissions, we're looking at increasing sustainable transportation use on campus, reducing the need for single occupancy vehicles for commute, expanding our electrical vehicle infrastructure. Um, we have 36 smart charger uh, station parking spots here on campus for electric vehicles, and we're hoping to expand that in the future also. And we're trying to find innovative ways to decrease the carbon intensity of the US fleet um, or UF vehicles and official business travel or um, air travel for study abroad. Now I'm gonna get into academics because that is the focus of today's discussion. I just wanted to give everyone a kind of overview of the climate action plan as quickly as I could. I still left out some, some big areas, but um, we can definitely talk about more of those if they come up, but let's focus on academics first. So the vision for our academics group is that students will leave the University of Florida with the knowledge of climate change that they've gained through their coursework or through their um, extracurriculars or through their experience at UF in order to be informed global, global citizens, equipped for success in the job market and meaningfully engaged in their communities. So some of the strategies that are being discussed in the academics group and that we're finalizing right now is increasing climate lit change literacy and learning outcomes. How do we do that? How are we expanding campus as a living lab opportunities? Oh, campus as a living lab is the concept of hands-on experiential learning or research that's driven to support um, actual climate action goals on campus. So how, in what ways can the climate action plan be um, serviced by research 
opportunities or student learning opportunities on campus? And how can we increase um, climate change curriculum and course content for our faculty? How can we give them better resources to incorporate this information in their curriculum and in their learning outcomes? And how can we then leverage the connections to research and extension being a land grant institution with UF IFAS extension spread out all over the state, conducting research all over the state? How can we leverage those connections better um, to inform our campus community here and in the state of Florida? So some of the group, the initiatives that we're building off of, this is, you know, things that people always want to uh, always want to know a little bit more about. What is what already exists? What are we working with right now? So right now, um, the University of Florida has over 250, I think it's maybe it's 240 to 250 undergrad and graduate courses that are sustainability related. Um, those are available on our website, and I have a link to that at the end of this. There are over 100 courses related to climate change that have been cataloged by the Florida Climate Institute. And um, there are lots of initiatives that we can build off of in our goals in the Climate Action Plan. There's the Sustainable Development Goals Faculty Guide that was designed by a group of faculty in 2020, specifically for UF, specifically for UF faculty to be able to incorporate the Sustainable Development Goals in their curriculum. Um, there are existing campus as a living lab initiatives that we can build off of. There are dozens of research institutes and centers uh, related to the University of Florida that um, have access to the kind of research connections that could influence or support climate action goals. And there are, of course, numerous, numerous extracurriculars. We have dozens of student orgs that are related to sustainability and climate action. And um, I'm sure there's lots of opportunities that I didn't even mention here. So I know I'm going way over time. I'm sorry, Alexis, I tried. <laughs> but um, I'm gonna, these are, this is a, a brief look at the goals that are being outlined in the academic section of the climate action plan. So we're looking for ways to have all undergraduate students receive climate change related curriculum during their time at UF. How are they gonna receive um, increased awareness of climate change related courses? Um, like I said, we're looking for more opportunities to um, take advantage of campus as a living lab structures. Um, so that we can explore the use of campus as a living lab for um, contributing to practical solutions that are outlined in CAP for reducing greenhouse gas emissions or other campus challenges related to mitigation or ad adaptation to climate change. Um, and then we're looking at the scope of UF within a academic sphere as a whole and how can we demonstrate leadership in advancing climate change solutions, including those that um, prioritize climate and social justice in the state of Florida and beyond, and leveraging the relationships and um, connections that we have to research and those organizations across the state. So with that, I have a lot of more resources on here. I'm not going to go into these in detail, and we will definitely send this out to you after this event so that you have all these links on hand. I will briefly mention, because it's just I have to, um, we do have UF Campus Earth Week coming up. Um, which is another great opportunity to learn more about CAP and all the things that our office does. And that will be linked at the bottom. That's April 6th to 12th. So I'm gonna go back to uh, maybe here and pass it off to Alexis. And you tell me if you want me to move around slides or, or what you would like me to do. Thank great. you guys Thank for you. listening. <laughs> I think this is, a pretty good slide to stay on, um, considering everyone does have access to the Jamboard now. So I think we can just leave that or leave it with this slide just for some brainstorming opportunities in the beginning. Um, but that was a very quick, brief overview of the climate action planning here at UF. And like Hannah mentioned, we are heavily focusing on academics today. So the next about 35, 40 minutes of the discussion, um, we are planning to be centered on academics and getting feedback from you all on what you think that should look like moving forward. Um, one of the awesome opportunities I've had as a student working on the Climate Action Plan is being able to interact with faculty that are looking into how we can expand campus as a living lab and actually achieve these visions and these ideas that are listed on this PowerPoint. But of course, none of that can happen if students are not willing to participate or on board with these ideas. And if it doesn't benefit students, there really is no purpose. Um, so we do have a couple questions that we'd like to start out with. But again, it's a very interactive discussion. Um, and we plan to keep it very open ended. Um, for 
the Jamboard. If you have any comments or um, questions that you don't want to unmute and ask, feel free to also put them there and we can interact that way. Um, we do have a couple people monitoring the Zoom chat as well in case you would like to use that. But highly encourage you to unmute yourself. Um, if you feel comfortable, challenge by choice, of course, introduce yourself with your name, your major, if you have a concentration um, or anything that's relevant to the sustainability conversation tonight. Um, but I will kick it off with the first question. Um, and of course, Sustainable UF interns, I'd love to hear from you all as well. Hannah, yes. Oh, sorry. I, you literally just read my mind at the very end there. I was just going to say all oh. of the interviews for our <laughs> students as well. And I know we. this is a great opportunity to, for us to discuss it internally and for us to hear, for me to hear what you guys are looking for as students. So don't be shy. <laughs> Perfect. So to kick it off, um, the first question I would like to ask and definitely would like feedback on is what do you all consider to be the most successful way to incorporate climate change literacy into your curriculum? So specifically your major, um, your department, your college, what do you think would be the most productive way to do that? Some of the ideas that have been talked about in the uh, working groups have been obviously influenced by general education requirements here at UF. So incorporating, or incorporating some type of climate change requirement there. There's also been conversation about modifying the Quest courses um, so that they have a climate change component. Um, and something that I'm a big fan of is incorporating more capstone and service-based learning into the degree program so that you're not required to take an additional course, um, but it's something that's built into your program for professional development that you can apply to your career. But I would love to hear from all of you again. Um, and if it's very specific to your major, if you could mention what your degree program is, that would be great as well. Uh, I'm actually just going to second the suggestion that Nelly just brought up. I'm Diego, I'm an environment, second year environmental science student. Um, I like to second the community service aspect of the, um, that suggestion. I feel like incorporating something that falls between the realm of strict coursework and um, or at least something that allows students to not just learn in the classroom, but learn in the field and with organizations and such. I feel like a community or service requirement would be a good way to involve climate change in a different sort of aspect that still falls within the realm of academics. I second that um, notion. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Going off of that, my uh, major is sustainability studies, in which my capstone is um, like an internship related to sustainability. Um, so uh, I'm in love with my degree. I, I love it a lot. It's very interactive. It's very open in which courses you're able to take and what type of sustainability you want to focus on. It's you could like take a bunch of courses about like a water um, insecure, like like water security issues and like water treatment and stuff like that. Or you could take something on like conservation. Um, the degree is very like open. And then you, in your final semester in the spring, um, you take a capstone in which the capstone course itself is literally an internship and then you email um the internship to the professor uh to get it approved um i thought that was very interesting because it not only do i feel like it takes a degree and shows you how to use the degree but it also put, gives you a hands-on approach to sustainability what you've been studying the past few years and um i know uh, alexis talked about like um capstones and I just made me think of my own capstone, which I'm very excited for in the future. Awesome. Yeah, I second that, Mohammed. I think capstones are really awesome. And for the um, degree plans that don't have capstones incorporated, I would love to see that, honestly. I think even outside of this conversation, they're very valuable. Um, but something I did want to ask and just see if there was any feedback on was research credit. So on the Jamboard, um, you'll see the three kind of topics are coursework, pro devs, and extracurriculars. Um, pro devs meaning professional development opportunities. I left that very broad because that looks very different for a lot of different students. Um, so I didn't want to narrow that down. But 
Um, I am a third year environmental science student, but I have a heavy focus um, in the veterinary health science realm um, as well. So it's interesting for me because a lot of my coursework has been outside of sustainability studies and it is not talked about, I don't feel enough um, or a lot at all. And there's definitely ways that I think it could be um, within One Health and just a bunch of different ways that you can make those intersections. Um, but something that's very popular within that um, area of study is earning credit for research. So that was something that I was thinking about was if there was a way that UF could encourage students, even if it's just for one semester to participate in research credit that has some type of connection to climate change. Um, I think there's a lot of ways that different majors and degrees can create a connection within sustainability. Um, obviously, it's more direct in STEM fields because it does often play into the core science of it, but I think as well as business and many other areas, as Mohammed, you were mentioning, even within sustainability studies itself, it takes a lot of different turns. Um, and again, that's another opportunity for students to do something outside of the classroom, get out of a textbook and really understand what it means to apply it to their field. Um, so I didn't know if ha anyone had any experience with research credits or anything in that nature. Also wanted to talk about the intersectionality of it, but if you do, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Yeah, I can actually share. I'm doing research right now. It's an independent project and it's in sustainability and psychology. Um, I'm just working with a few different, I'm working with a nonprofit, the Graham Center and my professor. And we're essentially trying to answer the question, what type of messaging gets people to act more sustainably? What is the most effective way to communicate that? So it was really a cool combination of all of my interests. And I think sometimes research, like getting into research can be really intimidating. So I feel like any way that the university could bring it down a level just to make it more accessible. I really like the idea of short-term research because a lot of the labs on campus really like emphasize, oh, we want you to commit for two semesters, a year or two. And sometimes people that aren't necessarily going to go into research as their career might feel like that's not for them. So maybe an opportunity that's more like a just a designated here's a period of mentored research in whatever kind of interdisciplinary field. Um, I think that would be a really cool idea for either degree programs to implement or different departments. I feel like there's room for it anywhere, though. Awesome. Um, moving forward a little bit, kind of switching gears, I wanted to pass it off to Mohammed to ask the next question. Um, yeah, so uh, another question that like we could look at overall is like what areas outside of a classroom specifically uh, can we like change climate literacy and like how can it be uh, incorporated into our everyday lives? For example, like within our student organizations, within our study abroad uh, trips, like things like in our everyday lives we do as students, but not necessarily in the classrooms and within our curriculums. I guess I can kind of take, um a stab at this one. Um, specifically, um, I'm a food science major. Um, I'm in the college of, I'm in the uh, Department of Food Science and Nutrition in CALS. Um, and I have like a lot of experience, especially when it comes to like understanding food waste and food insecurity. And I think when we look at it from a sustainability and like climate change level, um, there's so much that's very intersectional, but one aspect that's super intersectional to both movements is the idea of like composting. Um, and utilizing that uh, to be able to help solve a lot of those efforts uh, within just like a lot of these, you know, carbon sinks and a lot of these issues that we see within um, just a lot of food waste build up across the nation. Um, especially if we find ways to be able to try to integrate like composting stations across campus, you know, there's student organizations like the Student Compost Cooperative that are able to really help students be able to commit to composting. Uh, but, you know, it's in a very 
specific part of campus and not every student has that accessibility. But if we were to able to be able to kind of have that aspect um, within even like the dormitories or even in specific like high like density areas on campus, it could really help people one understand a lot more about um, sustainability studies um, and sustainability in general, uh, while also being able to have that commitment and really have that hands on level to it. I'm wondering, okay, first of all, can I just say how cool it is that we have so many people from different majors in this one conversation about academics? I just think that's so impressive and just speaks to the nature of climate action and how intersectional it is. Um, but I'm sure all of you are involved with student orgs yourself. Can anyone speak to groups that they are involved with they think like should be centered to some of these conversations? I can I mean, immediately, it off. I oh, think actually, of like, Jonathan, like go ahead. recovery network. Um, I think of other organizations um, such as there's one other that is like really prominent, like uh, Food Justice, UF, um, the Student Farm Workers Alliance, those kind of organizations. They have like a lot of aspects that really center around utilizing like agriculture and like food systems to be able to help solve a lot of these economic issues, but they probably have a lot of intersectional opinions about uh, sustainability and it's pretty important to have those people kind of see meet in the middle and see where that economic factor, but also that like sustainability factor can really clash um, in the best way possible. Uh, another organization that I've been recently involved with that I believe uh, Hannah you had um just um gave a presentation with them uh the students for the new urbanism um that organization i feel like should be uh more prominent in the sustainability conversation because obviously with the rapidly accelerating trend of people moving towards urban areas um and the way we design our cities in uh, densely populated areas in terms of um roads and accommodating for that amount of people, I feel like that has to be a part of the sustainability conversation since that, again, that's where people live and that's where quality of life is going to be um, highly measured, but also where a lot of waste and emissions originate from. So I feel like having that, or at least an urbanism component in the sustainability conversation needs to be uh, highlighted to a greater degree. Um, something like kind of building off of that, that I've personally been thinking about and like trying to meet with people about is specifically like the bus situations, um, here at the University of Florida and, and in Gainesville and how like a majority of the bus routes do like focus on the university when other people in Alachua County or, or in Gain the city of Gainesville use those bus routes. But, um, majorly, um, as of this summer, they're going to be like changing a lot of the bus services and like like a bunch of bus routes, the routes themselves are going to be like stopped and like buses themselves are gonna be like, there's less amount of uh, like buses themselves. And I think it's because an issue with like the fact that nobody, like they're trying to hire people to drive buses, but not a lot of people want to want those jobs. Um, but like for specifically like where I live over the summer, there's only going to be, I think, two buses and one bus stop that is actually going to be active. So I'm um, and it's like a 40 already. It's like a 40 minute wait for a bus. So it's just going to get much worse. And like I live off of like 20th Street or West 20 or not West 20, sorry, uh, Southwest 20th Avenue. And I know a lot of students live down that street because that's where some of the more affordable housing in um, Gainesville is so it, it was very interesting for me and I want to see like I was re talking to like my friends who sit on like the RTS advisory boards and I wanted to see like what the university is doing in the future and like what Gainesville or, like both of them together are doing in the future to try to like make uh, transportation in general more accessible and more sustainable because 
even though we do pay for these buses, a lot of students still do drive to school. And like a lot of students complain, oh, there's not enough parking. But I genuinely think that the bus systems are underutilized and then they get underfunded and then we don't have enough buses for the other students. But yeah. Was there a question in there that you wanted me to address, Mohammed, or was that just open-ended kind of no, thing? That, that was just, yeah, just me, like, going on a soapbox about the buses. <laughs> I think there's a lot of um, academic, maybe campus as a living lab opportunities in transportation. It's a gnarly, um, complicated issue with a lot of social implications, economic implications, psychological implications, like there's a lot wrapped up into transportation. So it's a really fascinating one. Hi there. Um, my name is Leah Nelson. Um, I've been a bit hesitant to add my input in here um, as I'm not currently enrolled at UF yet. Um, but I'll be starting my master's in sustainable development practice this fall. Um, I'm not very well versed in uh, UF campus or organizations or Gainesville life, um, but I'm just really here to, to learn more about sustainable UF's practices. So thank you for hosting this. That's awesome, one. I'm so happy to have you here. And I think transitioning into the third question is something that I've been trying to think a lot more about as well as a lot of these conversations um, have focused on undergraduate students and a lot of our engagement is with undergraduate students. Um, but I think there's a lot of potential for professional schools at UF um, and graduate programs to also be more heavily involved in a lot of these initiatives um, and that there's a need for it, um, especially I can really only speak for the um, fields that I've had interactions with, but it's definitely with COVID-19 and a lot of the other issues that we've faced in the past couple of years, been interesting to see the reactions from the field of um, medicine and healthcare in terms of sustainability efforts um, and waste generation, and obviously trying to keep everything sanitary at the same time. So no, it's awesome to have more graduate input. I love that. but. Chloe, I'll popcorn it to you to transition to the third question. Yeah. Um, sorry, I need to open the notes. So my question is based on my field. I thought it would be interesting to talk about it. So psychology is typically used to answer why questions about human nature. So I was wondering if you all had any ideas about how we could apply this field to study climate change efforts. What kind of phenomena could we try to explain with sustainability psychology? I think, sorry, is it, is it okay if I jump in? Of course. Okay, I, um, I think in my experience, it often comes down to um, moving people to take action. And it's, I often that get that question in my head, like why I, feel, I talk to so many passionate students and so many passionate groups, but getting them to move to taking action or getting in, like directly involved somehow is, some, is a hard, it's a difficult hurdle to overcome. So that's a question that I come back to. It's like, why don't people take that extra step? What is it that's, what barriers are they experiencing? And I know it's probably different for every person, but it does make me think of academics. I feel like there's probably more barriers than other things that maybe you can control in your life. So what are those barriers in academics that stop you from being able to engage with climate action curriculum or climate action courses or research or whatever it is? I think, uh, quick, yeah. oops, sorry. No, go ahead. I was gonna ask just, could you repeat the question? Cause I'll make sure that I'm like not going off track. Yeah, um, my question was about psychology. So how could we use psychology as a field of study to address questions about climate change efforts? Essentially, what are the why questions that we don't know the answers to yet? Yeah, um, I think, 
immediately when I think of like the psychological aspects to it, I immediately think about just like the be like the behaviors that humans especially do when it comes to just like us being comfortable and committing to a lot of these like unsustainable actions, especially because we've lived a lot, of, we've lived this entire life where we never really had a lot of, we never asked these like critical questions about, well, why do I use this product? Or why don't I cut up, you know, the soda, like the soda can, like little plastic things, or why don't I do these kinds of things? Because again, it's something that it's just, there's a level of privilege that comes with that. And I think if we were able to really gear our kind of efforts, especially within sustainability and making sure that people truly like change their methods of how they behave and how they think and how they perceive these aspects within sustainability, I think you could have a way, a bigger reach um, and a more successful opportunity to really impact um, the efforts of that and also making sure that that is way more receptive within academia. Yeah, that's definitely a great answer. Um, people being comfortable kind of in their own way of thinking. So I think academics has like this opportunity to educate people. And I think what we try and do at Sustainable UF is um, we focus on like actionable items. So calling people to do something specific, reasonable, and making sure that it's not like too abstract. And I think that kind of helps make it more um, like an accessible change, something that feels realistic. Um, I can kind of have a follow-up question to that um, in the realm of intersectionality. So what other um, subjects could be kind of intertwined with sustainability and climate action science? Um, I know we talked a little bit about involving business and economics. What other fields or subjects um, come out of that intersection? Um, personally, I think everything relates to sustainability and especially going forward in the future uh, with a future that is so uncertain with climate change. I think every aspect of every degree has to be looked at it with sustainability in mind. Um, I've taken a lot of geography classes and like a lot of the things and like currently I'm in a climatology class and it's very interesting because it talks about like studying the data over like decades and you see that like everything is related like how health is related to climate change um, all basic science uh, related to climate change. Uh, business, you're going to see a lot of like different things within business and economics where um, certain resources are going to become scarcer and it's going to be harder to get things. So that's related to climate change. Um, I just think everything is related to climate change. And I would think it would be very interesting if every like college had um, like sustainability related courses. I know like a lot of them already do, but I've been like having it like kind of like mandatory into like built into the degree itself because like personally um i can't see someone going into business without thinking of sustainability um and thinking like how in 20 years from now will a business be affected with the current way that uh, climate change is developing and things like that um but yeah that's just like my two cents on it I definitely agree with you, Mohammed. I think it should be within every discipline. Um, and I've mentioned a little bit about why I think it's so important for the intersection within the health sciences, but I also have been thinking a lot about the importance of it stretching into the tech industry and more of our like computer science programs, as well as engineering disciplines outside of environmental engineering, um, because we've reached a point that we need to develop innovative solutions. Like we've kind of surpassed that 1.5 mark, right? Scientists are debating as to what is the best approach to prevent some long-term um, catastrophes from continuing to unfold. And I think without a doubt, that's going to require some 
innovative solutions. And a lot of that is reliance on engineering and technology at this point. Um, like take EVs, for example, right? Everybody's pushing for more EVs. We want more like sustainable energy solutions, but that's going to require a lot of mining. That's going to require a lot more mineral use. It's going to require a lot more of those metals to repurpose what we already have, but also invent new things that can help us move in that direction. Um, and I think that puts a lot of pressure on, <clears throat> excuse me, like mechanical, chemical engineers um, and people who maybe previously had had their hands in sustainability conversations, but a lot of their work was focused on producing technologies and producing products that were in demand because we needed them now. Um, and I think there is a new atmosphere incorporating computer science as well, where even within environmental research, a lot of it relies on coding um, and access to technology to be able to share that data, collect that data, process all of it. Um, so that is just something that I've recently been thinking about. And I know both of those programs, especially here at UF, if they're within the Department of Engineering, have a lot of coursework attached to them um, and already tend to take longer sometimes than the four year um, range. Some of them go up into five, four and a half, five. Um, but having some type of sustainability components or climate change component in there, I think is going to be extremely important um, as we move forward and we push for people and companies to turn to these sustainable solutions, but they can't do that without engineers and tech developers being on board with these same initiatives. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has spent time thinking about that, but that's been on my mind recently. I really like that you brought up the tech um, electronic industry because uh, they're one of the top contributors um, of emissions and not only for like um, environmental sustainability issues, but also social sustainability issues. Uh, and then also I was going to add that uh, like sustainability in sports as well, um, there's an intersection there. We, we might want to consider, I know that sports is so big at UF, so um, my experience um, with like various like chemicals used or like excessive waste um, in, in my sport, um, the, the numbers are pretty high. So that's also pretty alarming. Um, talking like about the waste and like, I, I took this in a class recently about like the tech industry and like, there's arguments like, oh, well, we need to develop more tech for sustainability and stuff like that. But um, we learned a lot that tech itself is very not sustainable and the amount of waste created from techno uh, technology in general is ridiculous. Like it's a lot of it is not recyclable and reusable. So the more te like technical tech ah, <laughs> technological developments we have, the more waste we're producing, and it's very interesting because, like, um, a lot of like, for example, like solar panels. Solar panels, people claim like the what we took in the class was the example of like solar panels, like solar panels being sustainable, but in theory, you're using fossil fuels to mass produce solar panels. So then are they really sustainable? And like the minerals and uh, everything that you need to mine to make more solar panels, then it, once again, it asks, it brings the question, is that really sustainable? So um, I, yes, I definitely overlooked the tech industry, but thank you, Alexis, because like, and like focus more on sustainability because it as like, um, focusing like if it focuses on sustainability it could probably help to achieve a lot but i feel like right now uh along with a lot of industries it just tends to neglect it yeah i feel like that's definitely an interesting point i didn't necessarily think about it that way in my environmental science class we were kind of we had a framework that kind of proposed photo photovoltaic cells in solar energy as kind of the one of the most prominent like ways that we could um, rely on energy in the future. And there's some updates uh, on that kind of technology that harness it in a different way. But I feel like 
if we try and get more and more perspectives and more people on these ideas, we can be really deliberate about the choices we make. I feel like we're mostly talking about energy efficiency, but I feel like if we try to value or like understand the value of everything that we have now, like in the resource, we're talking about mining and fossil fuels. So if we consider like how important each of these decisions are, I guess I'm coming at it from a social psychological angle, but I think it's like in tandem with incorporating sustainability into every kind of field. So if you have someone trying to answer the engineering feats question of how, how do we possibly make something more efficient um, at the same time as how do we make sure that we're not basically reinventing a wheel in a way that is not actually more efficient. So having more and more people involved, I think is an interesting solution, but how do we realistically um, convince everyone that this is important? I don't know, but something to think about, I guess. Um, I definitely could hop onto this. Um, again, being like in the food science industry, um, a lot of the misconception is it's just that we're always talking about food, but being like a, in the food science, like just being in that industry, there's so much that goes into it, whether it's like packaging, whether it's the manufacturing process, whether it's the distribution process that we have to analyze uh, when creating these types of products. Um, and there's so much of like within that industry that really intersects so, like everything within sustainability. Um, especially when it comes to, you know, with the rise of, you know, sustainable packaging um, and being able to really think outside the box with like bamb like things like bamboo straws or making sure that there's uh, some sort of compostable uh, material um, or biodegradable materials. Um, there's so much that like really we see within our industry where we're really making a lot of pushes within sustainability. Um, but we still kind of have those struggles because we still kind of use a lot of these archaic processes um, that just to be able to produce certain food stuffs that many Americans would consume. But in the end, they're not very good when it comes to, again, carbon emissions and especially analyzing it from just the food waste perspective. You know, a lot of that is not allowing for our environment to be as like, like be as, um, I guess the term would be like, I guess, I don't know how to describe this, but um, it doesn't really allow for our environment to truly be a, a place where many different types of species um, outside of humans uh, can really thrive. Um, and I think that that's something that we have to take into account. And I think that that's why it's super interdisciplinary and why we see sustainability be such a big thing within my practices as a food scientist, but just like within the food industry as a whole. I just wanted to say I'm again really impressed with the um, different ideas and solutions being discussed here. Um, as students and just a younger generation being able to see all the nuance and complications of and overlaps of these climate change solutions or sustainability issues um, is really impressive and I'm very proud that you guys are at the University of Florida. Um, I wanted to jump over to a resource that I often share in many of my presentations. I know I'm, Alexis is probably gonna cut us off soon. We're gonna wrap up quickly, but um, this is just a tool that uh, it was lovingly shared on um, from some of my favorite climate change um, communicators and researchers. And if you are looking for a little bit of inspiration in your climate change or sustainability journey, I recommend this little tool to everyone. Sorry. Yes. No, yeah, I absolutely love that tool. And I'm also probably Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson's biggest fan. Um, if you don't know who that is, please like go to the Climate Institute, get her book, like watch her TED talk. She's phenomenal. Um, but we do only have a couple minutes left of this session. Um, so I did want to wrap this up with a call to action. Um, 
actually inspired a little bit um, by some of our previous student conversations, but also um, a podcast. Um, if you haven't heard how to save your uh, how to save a planet, it's a podcast that Dr. Johnson actually previously was involved with. Um, it still exists and is still run by um, some different hosts, but or it's the same host just without her now, I should say. Um, but it's incredible, and they also do calls to action at the end. Um, so we wanted to share with you a couple resources.